Hello. I'm just going to come out and say it. This is an iceberg video. I have 12 topics to run through, and each one will get progressively more serious than the last, and some won't be very funny to talk about. If at any point you're uncomfortable, nobody will blame you for clicking off. That being said, if you're still here, you might notice in the big Papa Breeze catalog of videos, there are gaps in between some episodes. Well, here's where the videos that were meant for them, all mushed together in the interesting history, film and television iceberg explained. Enjoy. Starting off at the top, A Day with Spongebob Squarepants is an unauthorized mockumentary that was allegedly released on November 22nd, 2011. I use the term allegedly because the production, release, and frankly the entire history of the project is shrouded in mystery. It all stems from this Amazon listing that can still be viewed to this day though it won't give you any hints as to what it's even about. The film gained a more widespread public knowledge of its supposed existence in July of 2014, and more so a year later. However, interest in acquiring a copy of the movie started on a much smaller scale in mid-2012, becoming a staple in any conversation regarding media that has become lost over time, countless threads on Reddit, 4chan, the Lost Media Wiki, and other forums have been created since 2014 with a common goal of finding any information of substance regarding the film. Of course, once something gains notoriety, everyone jumps on the bandwagon for better and for worse. Because of this, most of the quote, facts, uncovered since the search started, have sources that are dubious at best and completely contradictory at worst. So real definitive details about the oddity are not easy to come by. Essentially, production company Regal Films, who in and of themselves are not easy to find info on, had plans to produce the piece without permission from Viacom, the premise being as follows. In this mockumentary, Spongebob lives above ground, like all Hollywood superstars. Afraid that Spongebob is becoming old news, his boss runs a contest called Spend a Day with Spongebob. The contest makes Spongebob the talk of the town as thousands of kids enter to win. The lucky winner is Seth and he is ecstatic about his day with Spongebob. However, the day becomes a roller coaster ride as things don't quite go the way they planned. According to several different of the sources I mentioned earlier, claiming to be attached to the project, including the alleged creator of the film, the project was canceled in the very early stages and the Amazon page was created in order to gauge interest in the product. The alleged creator has gone on record saying he one day hopes to open a Kickstarter to fund the project, though nothing of the sort has materialized. And you have to believe legal issues create a significant roadblock regarding any sort of release. Rescuers is a film by Walt Disney Productions, released in theaters on June 22, 1977. The film received critical acclaim and was popular enough to warrant a sequel released 13 years later in The Rescuers Down Under. Good movie all around, but its legacy is linked to something a little more complicated. In 1992, The Rescuers made its home media debut. The current CEO at the time, Michael Eisner, was pushing hard for releases in the home media market, a decision that benefited both Disney and the consumer at whole. Problems didn't arrive 
until the movie was re-released on January 5th, 1999 as part of the Walt Disney Masterpiece Collection. As only three days later, Disney announced a complete recall of the almost three and a half million copies produced as they contained a quote, objectionable background image. Being as straightforward as possible, the image in question is two isolated frames a little over a half an hour into the film that depict a topless woman. And no, I can't show that here. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Now, Disney is no stranger to controversial bits appearing in their movies, The Little Mermaid and The Lion King being just two examples. What sets this apart, though, is two things. Number one, this isn't a rumor or something possibly looking almost like a topless woman. That's what it is. Most importantly, I wear a size 2X jersey and you know where to find me. And number two, unlike the previous examples, Disney stepped in themselves and owned up to it, even before the previously mentioned frames were reported on a widespread basis. Spokespersons for Disney claim the reel was used for the 99 release was one used during its original theatrical run over 20 years ago, and the tampering must have been done sometime during post-production's process. It also was from a different reel than the 92 home release. No matter how it got there, this remains the most clear-cut example of adult material in classic Disney media, and it holds its place there. As for the VHS tapes, the recalled tapes were said to be destroyed, with the March 23, 1999 reissued copies having the offending frames edited to remove the images. The Black Cauldron is an animated film released by Walt Disney Pictures in 1985. A beautiful looking movie to be fair, as well as the 25th Disney animated feature film, though it isn't fondly remembered like everything else at the time. But why is that? A few factors can be to blame. For starters, the movie was originally scheduled for a 1984 holiday theatrical release, but test screenings did not go well to say the very least. What was supposed to be a movie that would appeal to a broader teenage audience instead horrified the children in attendance, so changes had to be made. On top of that, development was smack dab in the period where Michael Eisner was brought in as CEO. And while that's a good thing, fight me if you disagree, he also brought in Jeffrey Katzenberg as Disney Studio Chairman who was particularly critical of the film. So when the test screenings went badly, Katzenberg ordered specific scenes to be cut for time as well as excessively scary content. Joe Hale, the producer of the film, objected to the rigorous edits, so Katzenberg decided, I'll do it myself, and started hacking out bits and pieces of the film, only stopping when Eisner convinced him to. In total, 12 minutes ended up being cut, with some cuts far more noticeable than others. The result was a mess that flopped at the box office, and even with the edits, The Black Cauldron still became Disney's first animated film to earn a PG rating. Fans remain hopeful that the original, uncut version might someday become available but judging by the company's overall treatment of the film, it is highly unlikely. Hello, just me checking up on you. If I've done everything correctly, there should be some interesting links as well as references for the various entries all in the video description below, in case you want to delve deeper on anything. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the show. October of 2000, 
Nickelodeon aired its Snick or Treat Halloween special. A yearly occurrence, this special was different for one significant reason. It housed the debut of the television film Cry Baby Lane. There isn't a whole lot of information known about the small-scale production, other than its budget $800,000 cost. A story about brothers, friends, a set of conjoined twins, one evil, one good, possessions, and a skeleton. In general, there was nothing particularly noteworthy about this film, other than being a little out of place on Nick. So what makes the movie significant? Well, the movie was never showed outside the US, never released for home media, and seemingly swept under the rug, with most questions directed at the company about the film completely ignored or replied by treatment that the film never existed. Most speculate it received a large enough volume of calls and complaints over the supposedly TVY7 movie that the network buried it, but no matter the reason, it was nowhere to be found. A reoccurring situation with most pieces of lost media, the search for the film was on, and in 2011, the search found Reddit user Fire Salad Peach, who claimed to own a VHS with a recording of the movie. But unlike all the previous claims from many users, Fire Salad Peach pulled through and uploaded it to YouTube, blowing up in popularity. Seeing a chance to cash in on the hype, as well as pop a rating, Teen Nick advertised the airing of the movie, quote, so scary it was locked away for Halloween that year, proving they still had the movie this whole time. Interviews with persons attached deflected any sort of implications that the movie was banned or removed in any way, merely a footnote in time that was forgotten. Since its re-airing in 2011, it has re-aired a handful of times and now sits as a significant example of a search for lost media being successful, as well as gaining a cult-like following through no fault of its own. On January 23, 1999, a small budget movie would make its debut at the Sundance Film Festival. The movie made full use of the concept of found footage horror and made a big enough impact to receive a wider release in July of that year, and it ended up changing the horror genre forever. That movie was The Blair Witch Project. The absolutely terrifying found footage fictoral documentary followed the three film students studying and documenting the unseen force terrorizing them throughout their days and nights. Gritty, ugly, and real, it truly is horror unlike anything previous. But that is the Blair Witch Project. On Halloween later that year, Cartoon Network was planning on airing a marathon of much-beloved cartoon staple, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Rather than make several bumpers and promotional material, the animators pitched a completely different concept, the Scooby-Doo Project. The idea was to make a faithful and respectful parody of the Blair Witch Project, using the Scooby-Doo game. The result was probably one of the weirdest pieces of Scooby-Doo media, for the time at the very least, somehow both spooky enough to do the source material justice, as well as funny and light-hearted enough to have that Scooby-Doo charm. The complete Scooby-Doo project can be viewed and enjoyed in its entirety now, and continues to be heavily entertaining, especially when compared to the original. Mesmerized is an Australian TV show that was originally set for air in 2015 on Australia Channel 7. Frankly, I'm not sure what genre to place this show under, 
as it's framed as a reality show, but it's, it's really something. It follows TV personality and hypnotist entertainer Peter Powers, causing normal people problems through hypnosis. On October 15, 2015, the first episode aired and received an abysmal 411,000 viewers. An absolutely horrible rating for a show, much less a debut episode. Due to its terrible rating, the axe came down swiftly and mercilessly, canceling the series after just its first episode. Now according to Wikipedia, the remaining episodes didn't air, but that's not true. Sorry, I'm trailing off here for a second, as for some reason, I can't edit Wikipedia right now, but all six episodes are available on the UK Amazon Prime video page for you to stream. But I highly suggest against it, as the show sucks. Wacky hijinks include examples such as convincing people that they're a zombie, convincing people to marry an alpaca, convincing people that you're an animal, and other funny experiences. But yeah, so bad it was axed after one episode, you know what you're gonna view. Hello guys, I'm back one last time I promise. This is the dividing line. Everything is serious from here. If you don't like serious content, I won't blame you for watching a different video. But if you're still here, enjoy the rest of the show. exception, I have covered this topic before, so bear with me. Tomorrow's Pioneers was an incredibly controversial children's television show that aired on TV from 2007 to 2009. It follows the young host of the show, Sarah Barham, and her mascot co-host friends discussing what it's like to live in Palestine. What makes the show so different is the extreme subject matter covered, as well as the heavily anti-Semitic and anti-American views discussed. Some examples of the heavily controversial material includes Far For the Mouse, cheating on a test, and blaming it on the Jews, who quote, destroyed his home, leaving him to forget his books and his notes under the rubble. As well as, in the following episode, Far For being beaten to death for refusing to sell his land to Israel, explained as him being a martyr, defending the lands of his forefathers. Death would be a regular occurrence on the show, as well as the heavily religious overtones. The next co-host brought in to replace Farfor would be introduced as Nahul the Bee, who dies waiting to get into Egypt, unable to survive without an emergency surgery and assumed the rabbit dies in the hospital after succumbing to the wounds he sustained in the attacks on Gaza. Tomorrow's Pioneers is an extreme example of brainwashing in children's TV, as well as a window into the kind of media that's commonplace on other parts of the earth. The Crow is a gritty film released in 1994, based off James O'Barr's comic book. A phenomenal film, with stunning visuals released to critical acclaim, The Crow is also remembered for a reason far more dark and depressing. On March 31, 1993, lead actor Brandon Lee was filming a scene that involved his character, Eric Draven, being shot. In order to pull the stunt off, the production employed many props and effects, in this case using blank rounds, essentially powder with primer, but no actual bullet. This gives the authentic look of a realistic gunshot without any sort of risk or danger of harm. What followed was a case of a squib load. For scenes with close-ups of the gun, 
dummy cartridges were used. Essentially, a real bullet without the gunpowder needed to propel the bullet out of the barrel. However, at some point, a dummy round was discharged with an active primer, lodging it in the barrel without any indication it had gone off. The stray dummy was not identified until far too late, as once the blank was fired for the scene, the force was enough to dislodge the bullet from the barrel and strike Brandon Lee in the abdomen, who collapsed to the ground. After being rushed to undergo surgery to save his life, Brandon Lee was pronounced dead at 1.03 p.m. from the unintentional gunshot. The incident ruled an accident. Production ground to a halt, and only three days of filming were planned to complete the film but the future of any possibility came into question. Finally, after much deliberation, the cast and crew reconvened to finish the movie, using a combination of rewrites and CGI in an attempt to film scenes not yet filmed. Ultimately, the film was released on May 13, 1994, and became a box office success and a cult classic being known as Brandon Lee's best role. The movie itself dedicated to both the deceased star as well as his fiance. In 1939, The Wizard of Oz released in theaters. While not the first adaptation of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, the 1939 MGM-produced version is far and above the most famous version of the source material, as well as one of the most iconic movies of all time. Even 80-plus years later, the film still stands as one of the best movies to ever receive a theatrical release. But you already know all that. Comparatively, what you might not know is that despite the happy atmosphere of the film, the actual filming process was a complete nightmare, plagued with issues. The original actor cast as the Tin Man, Buddy Ebsen, was sent to the hospital nine days into filming, his lungs coated with the aluminum dust that his face paint was comprised of. While on the topic of makeup, Margaret Hamilton's was copper-based and stained her skin with a green tint for weeks after filming. In addition to that, Margaret also suffered first and second degree burns on her face and right hand from the fire effects, shelving her for almost two months. A few more, the snow effect is literally just asbestos. Allegedly, the Munchkin actors engaged in an awful lot of drunken behavior and were constantly having the police call to their hotel they were staying at due to, quote, noisy adult activities. And overall, Judy Garland was treated absolutely terribly by members of staff, being constantly harassed about her body image. Of course, the most well-known rumor of the film is the alleged depiction of a hanged munchkin appearing in the film. To be fair, low-res VHS tapes do look a little suspicious, but it's officially been explained away as a shadow cast from a bird an explanation they were so confident in that they felt the scene needed to be cleaned up in all subsequent releases. So keep that in mind. Midnight Rider is a film adaptation of Greg Allman's autobiography, my Cross to Bear. Starting development in early 2013, there was a lot of promise initially behind the project as it went into filming in early 2014. However, all of that promise vanished in an instant. On February 20th, 2014, four days before the first day of filming, the crew set up on a remote property with permission from the landowner to film a camera test. This location contained a railroad track that ran through a bridge. Now, while they did have permission to film on the lot, 
they did not have permission to film on the tracks or the bridge. However, despite this, director Randall Miller requested them set up there anyway. While only a camera test was planned, the team was instructed to set up to film an extended dream sequence involving star William Hurt on a hospital bed. But then a terrifying situation arose. A train rounded the corner on the track they were set up on, forcing the crew off the bridge. Having underestimated the speed of the oncoming threat, the crew clamored to try and save the equipment, trapping part of the team on the bridge, unable to escape fast enough. The metal hospital bed was struck by the train, throwing shrapnel towards the stranded crew. One member, camera assistant Sarah Jones, was struck by a piece of the bed and in turn throw her in front of the still moving train, killing her. In addition to Sarah Jones, seven others were injured in the incident. During the subsequent investigation, it was revealed CSX, the owners of the railroad, had denied both requests by the production to film on the track, and the fault lay on the director for insisting despite the denial. Director Randall Miller, first assistant director Hilary Schwartz, and executive producer Jay Sedrish all pled guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter and criminal trespass. Additionally, several civil lawsuits have been brought against the production in an attempt to halt continued filming. More than likely, the film will never be released, as despite producers having hope that it will be continued one day, the project is largely considered abandoned. Groupie is a short film recorded in 1996, created by music icon Marilyn Manson. It details the events taking place at a house party that he held. The other guests in attendance were informed that a woman would be arriving and Manson would be filming something. The actor, on the other hand, was informed with only a vague description of what was expected to happen. What followed was essentially the actor, dubbed the titular groupie, being forced to do more and more disturbing things as the other house guests watch, growing slowly more uncomfortable as they are unable to distinguish planned reactions from genuine ones. The exact contents of the film are still largely unknown, as only three people have ever been allowed to view it. Marilyn Manson himself, Andy Dick, and longtime manager Tony Chula, who convinced the star to never release the short film, as it could possibly be used as sufficient evidence to convict Manson if criminal investigation ever arose. As far as the content of the film, the actor was subject to everything from drinking urine to being tied to a chair to repeat the phrase, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Though allegedly, at some point, blood was shed and a gun was produced for intimidation. As of now, the only clips that have been publicly released are that of the last bits of the video album Dead to the World. And at this point in time, I don't see the film ever being released in any non-private sense. But knowing Marilyn Manson, nothing is ever out of the question. Trepidation is a surgical process comprised of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. In ancient times, the procedure was used in a religious sense, essentially used as a way to release evil spirits from the body. In a more medical sense, it's theorized to have been used for treating epilepsy, headaches, head wounds, and even generic mental disorders. Nowadays, of course, the procedure is not used, as it carries a high risk of infection as well as high risk of death, 
if the layer of dura matter is breached. Additionally, even if everything goes properly, you can still suffer from heavy blood loss, hemorrhages, and severe trauma. With all that knowledge, Heartbeat in the Brain is a 1970 documentary produced by, directed by, and featuring Amanda Fielding, documenting her performing the operation on herself. The film was screened in 1978 at the Sidan Gallery in New York, where one of the reviewers claimed multiple members of the audience fainted while viewing due to the intense visuals. The film was shown so scarcely that even now, the only actively viewable footage is snippets within the 1998 documentary, A Hole in the Head. Despite the common belief that the movie has been lost to time, the film has been publicly screened as recently as the 28th of April 2011, where its quote, mythical status was referenced during its screening at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. So it is out there. I assume it's just owned on a very secure and secretive basis. And while no copies are available to view online, it's not outside of the realm of possibility that one day it very might will be. You made it. That's the end of the video. It was a long one, not gonna lie, but I appreciate you sticking with me to the end. If you're here, you should know this took a little bit longer than normal to get out, so hopefully it does well. You all have a wonderful day, and any suggestions, leave them below. Goodbye.